This is my second book, um, and I am focusing on Axis and Allied Intelligence and Propaganda on the U.S.-Mexico border in a broad sense, uh, including the Southwest, uh, during the 1930s and 1940s. And I, cl I call my approach a, a global microhistory. And so uh, microhistory is just kind of a fancy way of saying that I go to different places. I've also been very lucky, and I, I spent a year in Mexico City looking at the archives there, in Washington, in Berlin, uh, in London. And I plan to go to Tokyo to do some uh, research there as well. And basically what I do is I just look for these apparently insignificant details that just make me say, holy crap. And they offer a window into a much larger reality. So I've been focusing on, on certain is incidents. For instance, there's an Office of Naval Intelligence document that purportedly um, the Japanese and Nazi uh, smugglers are passing opium through the El Paso Juarez International Crossing. And this is back in 1940. And in order to understand that, you have to go really to understand not only the local ramifications, but the global. And then there, there, there are other um, microhistorical events. In 1942, also the military U.S. Military Intelligence Division is looking at evidence for barrio youth in El Paso and how they're working with Axis agents, Mexican fas fascist agents, right? So it's like Mexican Nazis, like what, what is that, right? So these are the kind of clues that have led me to ask bigger questions. And one of the ones that I was very interested in, and this is also 1942, Office of Naval Intelligence, and that has to do with um, indigenous espionage. And the Yaqui uh, collaborators supposedly, also again with the Germans and the Japanese, who are supposedly, and this is, still at the level of rumor in the intelligence, um, using mirrors to pass information about certain movements, railroad movements and what have you, uh, between the United States and Mexico. So we've all heard of uh, Navajo code talkers. This kind of throws a whole different twist on kind of these histories. So microhistorical um, incidents such as these or events, uh, lead me to ask different questions about these global movements. And they, they, they lead me to look at different perspectives that I probably wouldn't have asked if I had started you know, as a tr traditional PhD where you set your hypotheses and you already kind of have determined what you're gonna look at. And so the questions are the nature of propaganda and intelligence. There's a lot of entrenched narratives already that at the border, there is this uh, invasion anxiety that has been going on for many, many decades, right? And it's relevant today if, if you read the newspapers. So it leads me to ask those kind of questions. Another question that it's led me to ask is the role of indigeneity, and questions of indigenous identity in the propaganda affecting uh, fronterizo communities. So in, uh, we know, for instance, on this side of the border, Nazi agents would go to the different uh, communities in order, as anthropologists, as linguists, in order to say, for instance, um, get information of potential. That they already knew from World War I, the Nazi agents, <coughs> that, that, for instance, um, there had been uh, Native American soldiers that had pr provided codes. The same thing would happen in World War II. So you have German-American boon people, including some of the... Uh, Native Americans in their uh, pro-Nazi rallies wearing swastikas and you know, in one case it was Red Cloud uh, from, a, um, from the, the Stilex Reservation. In another case it was New Moon from a Cherokee anti-Semitic writer and lawyer. So we know that the Germans are trying to recruit Native Americans on this side of the border. What I think my work looks at is how some of these agents we're also working on the Mexican side of the, the border with the Yaquis. So ultimately, what I hope to show in, in, in my book is just the importance of what seems to be the periphery and these global uh, battles of propaganda and intelligence. And a question that totally surprised me is the centrality of indigeneity in those questions of global fascism 
on the U.S.-Mexico border. Thank you.